I want to take a few minutes and introduce you to the Institute for Molecular Engineering because it really is unique, even not only for the University of Chicago, but even in the world of engineering. Um, when you say you're doing molecular engineering, not everybody knows what you're talking about. They think maybe you're a synthetic organic chemist or something and you're engineering individual molecules. And what we really mean is we're engineering with synthetic molecular building blocks. We're building from the molecular level up to try to create properties that uh, are interesting from the electronic, optical, mechanical, chemical, or biological point of view, and creating functional systems that are macroscopic, including manufacturing by biological routes to new ways of doing computing. And our aim is to um, essentially merge the ideas of an academic research institute with an educational academic department. They call us the Institute for Molecular Engineering. We could have been called the Department of Molecular Engineering. We're about that size. But Institute kind of captures the dual mission of interdisciplinarity and uh, autonomy because we do have the capacity to hire our own faculty and so on. One of the things we're doing is, is kind of uh, bringing out in the environment of the University of Chicago how engineering is a little bit different from science. Um, our job is to accelerate how science is used in society, and they're not the same thing. You know, science is about curiosity and nature and discovery and figuring out how the world works, and engineering is about design and application and invention and changing how the world works, but they're certainly cooperative. There's a really interesting book, if any of you are interested in kind of history of science and understanding science. The name of the book is called Pasteur's Quadrant. It was written by a Princeton historian of science who died a few years ago, Donald Stokes. But he kind of divided technical work in science of engineering into four quadrants <clears throat> based on whether it was aimed at understanding things fundamentally and whether it was uh, brought in considerations of practical utility. Everybody tries to stay away from the no-no quadrant. <laughs> I don't know that there's any other way to validate scientific. Maybe there's a third axis, you know, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but, you know, his idea was that Edison did things in a completely, as we now say, Edisonian way. Uh, aimed at practical utility, not really uh, creating fundamental understanding. Niels Bohr, the great uh, high-energy physicist, aimed at understanding and didn't particularly drive toward practical utility, but Pasteur was a brilliant chemist and microbiologist uh, in France who had made some great scientific discoveries, uh, but also was a consultant to the fermentation industry. And some of the things he learned about microbiology and chiral crystals and so on came out of his work with the fermentation industry. And so instead of thinking about technological development as just strictly science push, we are thinking about it as a kind of a cyclic interaction between science and engineering. And I think I and my colleagues um, are uh, really uh, into this uh, complementarity between science and, and engineering. So engineering is the path from science to society, and the motivating idea is to exploit or bring to bear molecular level science for solutions to societal problems in energy, healthcare, information technology, environment, and any other important things that we can think of. Um, there was a long planning process here at the University of Chicago before I came on the scene early in 2011. I actually showed up here 15 months ago in, in late July uh, of 2011. But the planning process had been going on for four years or so and, you know, conceived of this idea of molecular engineering before, uh, before I came and was thinking about what could it produce. New uh, molecular electronic devices, new bio-inspired materials, uh, new membranes, new therapeutics and stuff, and, and, and I, I agree that these are good things. The planning process suggested that when the new director came, uh, we should pick some of these themes and run with them and hire theme leaders, but that didn't seem quite right to me. I was really thinking more about how do you 
get the right expertise into a group like this. And I was thinking, and this is how we're pursuing it, that what we needed to do was to build teams that spanned the appropriate expertise to do engineering at the molecular level, that we aren't going to be creating de different departments of engineering within molecular engineering. But we need expertise in how to make materials, how to manipulate biology, how to image, how to catalyze reactions, how to process things, and how to compute things. And that's the kind of expertise that we need so that we can do these things. And we have 25 appointments, and that seems feasible. But it's not going to look like any other engineering department anywhere else in the world. Elements of this exist in many engineering departments everywhere. The collection that we're creating doesn't exist anywhere. So I'm happy to introduce <laughs> our first new faculty member, who's Juan de Pablo, sitting in the back of the room there. Uh, joined us from the University of Wisconsin, uh, an expert in molecular modeling, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, polymer physics, nanostructured materials uh, by design. And we're especially lucky that he joined us along with his University of Wisconsin colleague, uh, Paul Neely, uh, who's an experimentalist who works on patterning uh, uh, organic materials uh, uh, for a variety of applications. And together, they have made huge strides in applying these ideas of self-assembly, the same things, the same general idea that forms our micelles, they've been able to uh, apply to the lithographic processes that are used to create patterns in integrated circuits for computer chips. Working with Intel and Hitachi and, and other companies, they've, been, they've figured out how to make patterns. They've also uh, figured out how to, well, in order to, their way of making patterns is to make a template that is replicated in the material. But in some ways, most importantly, they've figured out how to make templates that when you put the polymer on them, make a smaller scale structure than the template itself, which is very important because we're getting to the end of what's called Moore's Law, where we can no longer directly make the patterns. Uh, they're too small. The end of Moore's Law is about at the level that I talked about, about the 10 nanometer level. Uh, and these guys, um, the semiconductor industry, believes that this may be one of the techniques that can get us down to that small-scale structure. Uh, semiconductor circuits aren't made out of dots. They know how to make lines, too. They know how to make bended lines and curved lines, so they can really do it all. Uh, the third hire uh, who will join us on January 1st is David Auschelam who's a physicist and electrical engineer uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, some people have asked me, uh, are you only hiring people you know? And <laughs> well, I mean, one of my answers is, if I don't know them after being around here, by, being around the field by, for 35 years, they probably aren't that good anyway. So, <laughs> so yes, I'm hiring people that I know, at least at the senior level. Hiring junior people, which we'll get to, is a whole other story. Um, you really have to investigate things. And David is an expert in um, quantum mechanics as it's manifest not in, you know, the Higgs boson, whatever that is, or what, you know, but rather in semiconductor devices, using quantum mechanical phenomena in the bulk to address spins and, and so on. And uh, he's been one of the leaders in what's called spintronics that uh, is uh, widely thought to be something that will take the place of computing when we, uh, by digital computation, when we get to the end of Moore's Law. That is, instead of using simple ones and zeros, we can use the whole probability spectrum of quantum mechanics to try to do computing. And don't ask me any questions about that, okay? <laughs> I'll skip over that. So how are the themes shaping up with this way of hiring talent instead of themes? With Juan and Paul and me, we certainly have some strength in self-assembly and biomimicking materials. We're developing one in quantum information engineering with David. We're working on some other hires uh, that relate to these uh, ideas of engineering applied to understanding the immune system. And there's one other one that we haven't acted on yet, but uh, 
there's a big proposal coming out of Argonne that might get funded by the Department of Energy called an energy storage hub that would bring $25 million here focused in Chicago. And if that happens, we will certainly hire people in the energy storage area to further our cooperation with Argonne batteries and things like that. So, you know, we're moving quickly. We, there's four of us now. I think we'll have five to eight in the first two years. Um, we are already uh, offering research experiences and projects for undergraduates, and I don't think we've all made a firm commitment to this, but we're close to uh, saying that we're going to offer an elective course for undergraduates uh, in the spring quarter. Ron smiling, I, you know. We're going to seek approval to launch a graduate program this year, an undergraduate program next year, and we want to build connections because, I mean, one of the most important things, and you, you are, um, among others, proof of this, the, the real reputation of an academic program is what the people who go through it eventually do in life, and we really need to help make those connections very effectively. So the opportunity is to create a powerful new kind of engineering program that transcends traditional disciplines from the start, will focus on engineering systems from the molecular level up and create world-leading programs in areas of interest to society. I think we can leap ahead of traditional engineering schools uh, by this model of not focusing on what the traditional engineering disciplines are. You know, and I worked in chemical engineering departments we would bemoan the fact that we couldn't keep the students for five or six years and add, you know, five or ten more chemical engineering courses because they were so, they needed so much more chemical engineering to be effective. We have a little different philosophy here. We're going to talk about what you can do with what you do know, not overloading people with uh, more than they need to know. And we really want to take advantage of the breadth of education that one can get not only in technical subjects, but in economics and social sciences and so on at the University of Chicago. Uh, so we have four people uh, on board. We're talking actively with two more and considering two further more seriously in areas ranging from new materials to quantum information to cancer therapy. Serious discussions with a wide array of uh, companies. Many of you have met Sharon Thang, who is our executive director, who started on September 15th, who brings a great wealth of scientific and industrial and managerial experience um, to us, and we also have a, a financial manager, so we're starting to look like a regular bureaucracy. So. <laughs> this is my, my last slide. You know, the aim is to really become a destination for people seeking a distinctive approach to engineering, research, and education embedded in a campus with a superb liberal arts, liberal arts education. But in a city and in an environment that has tremendous and growing resources for technological innovation. So that's my story on both counts, my personal story and the IME story. Be happy to have questions now from people who are here. Uh, uh, and, and please use the microphone so people off-site can, can hear what you have to say. And those of you off-site can be tweeting and emailing uh, questions to us, and they'll be picked up soon. I have a question. The idea of self-assembly is very intriguing to me, and I can't picture how you take these hydrophobic elements in the little spiral guys that go around the outside. I mean, do you mix them together in a bowl? I, you know, yeah. Sort of like, yeah. get, give us some idea of how you do this. Yeah, that's, that's a really excellent question, frankly. And you don't always do it the same way. I mean, but, but um, <clears throat> My cells, th this is a well-known physical chemistry uh, fact. I, I, oh, you, you're mic'd, okay. Yeah, I think I'm mic'd, yeah, thanks. Um, there is what's called a critical micelle concentration. So molecules like I showed you will dissolve in water as individual molecules, but not aggregate until you get them to a certain concentration. So there's a, a trigger that is caused by concentration uh, that causes these micelles to form spontaneously at what's called a CMC or a critical micelle concentration. So yes, in, in, in many of the cases, you can just mix them together in a bowl. Sometimes some elements of them are too hydrophobic or something like that, and so you might have to um, start out by putting them in a mixed solvent that uh, 
reduces the, uh, well, th that's able to handle more hydrophobic things and keep them in solution, as opposed to them falling in a chunk to the bottom of the beaker where you can't do anything with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. now, you, you used uh, the hydrophobic, hydrophilic aspects of, of polarized molecules, like water being polarized. Oh, if there are people I know are working with DNA, which which uh, DNA attached to these things has a, a code on it that you can hook to other things specifically yeah. and build in the same sense spontaneously. If you haven't mentioned that. I'm sure you must have some program on that. Yeah, the, the thing about the uh, the kind of self-assembly you were just asking me about that's different in DNA is that in water any hydrophobic things stick together. They're, they're driven by the fact that they want to get out of water. And at a certain concentration, you have so many molecules that are hydrophobic that are exposed to water that it's better if they just shield themselves by getting together, that they reduce their adverse interactions. So, but any hydrophobic thing, uh, to a first approximation, sticks to any other hydrophobic thing. The thing that DNA introduces is programmability and addressability so that only this sequence sticks with its partner sequence. And yeah, there are people that are thinking about how to incorporate programmable and addressable self-assembly into materials. I'm not doing it, and so far there's only <laughs> two of us here. Uh, we, we do a lot of things with DNA, actually, uh, even in my group, but not so much on that program self-assembly right now. But it's, a, it's an active thing. The interdisciplinary aspect of this is, I think, thrilling. Uh, so I'm curious about how you are interacting with uh, the physics department, the biological sciences, and how how does how is this going to work? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's that's also a fantastic question. So I didn't emphasize, but it's true, that we are our own academic unit. We're not part of the physical sciences division or the biological sciences division. That's, that's partly so that we can have our own start to creating engineering. It's partly really um, comes from uh, the fact that the administration wants to make it clear that new positions are being uh, allocated for engineering as opposed to rearranging the faculty and creating engineering from what we've already got. Because we could, and that, that gets right to your point. Even though there isn't engineering here, there's probably 30 or 40 people on this campus that would fit my definition of molecular engineering. And we're reaching out to those people. They've, a lot of them, I've, I've engaged 12 people in uh, the faculty recruitment process who've been really helpful in identifying and persuading people to come. Uh, we aren't making joint appointments yet, but we will. Um, because I think, you know, frankly, I'm not, I, I, I think especially if we hire a few more sort of in this mode of picking our own people, uh, we will have established the <laughs> idea that we are capable of doing it and that we are uh, an independent academic unit, but we don't want to be too independent. You know, we want to have porous connections. So Juan and Paul and I, the guys who are here, have dozens of interactions with people in chemistry and physics. And the one big thing that I guess I really haven't mentioned yet is that we are, are also, it sort of came up in my introduction, but not only me, but all of the other faculty members are also senior scientists at Argonne. So we're really trying to exploit the connection with Argonne as well. We have a question from Twitter. It's from David M. Pickett. His question is, what would the elective class for undergraduate students cover? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, we, uh, um, we're, it, we're probably going to call it Introduction to Molecular Engineering. And I, I think it'll be a combination of highlights of modern molecular engineering, sort of like the one I gave at the beginning, but you know, perhaps broken down a lot more so that the students can understand we'll have more time, you know, we'll have 
30 or 40 hours to talk with them instead of <laughs> 45 minutes. Um, and bringing out some of the things that are distinctive about uh, engineering. So, you know, even though the, the example that uh, I showed you about nanoparticles sort of sounds like an application, it, it's really more science at the stage that it is now. It's driven by an application, but I don't know about the toxicity. I don't know about the duration of the lifetime of these things. These are all things that an engineer needs to know. You need to know how to specify the properties of what you're making. And so we want to bring in some of the design aspect. We want to bring in some of the economic aspects uh, to students that uh, you know may be taken by a scientific idea, but there's a big difference between a good scientific idea and a good technological idea. So we'll try to bring out some of those things too. I'll ask a question if that's okay. Please. Um, you, you mentioned how you've uh, connected with uh, argon in terms of energy, and you mentioned the 40 people that you've identified that you're beginning to work with. So especially in the medical area with, for example, I don't know, synthetic vaccines where your work is just in a, in a research stage, how do you see that proceeding? And uh, do you think that work would be done in uh, the hospital, or would it be done in your institute, or would it be done elsewhere? Well, I, I, for some of the biomedical applications, um, you know, there's almost an infinite amount of time you can spend in our labs, let's say, in the institute, refining this or that idea. But if you want to get really serious about it, you have to start talking to real doctors uh, and figuring out what are some of the constraints on what is actually useful to them. So I see, at least from our own work, and certainly some of the other bioengineers who might come here, uh, the idea would be that we keep going on the, the, the fundamental new ideas, but as we think something starts to get ready for prime time, we try to get a physician partner to help us move it more toward clinical things. I mean, the, the sort of sequence is, you know, lab, cell culture, animals, humans, and uh, we're not we're not anywhere close to humans yet, even with our stuff. So I actually, can I ask a question about more oriented toward the science you <coughs> talked about? Um, your synthetic vaccine idea was fascinating, actually. And I was wondering that you showed us that long sort of cylindrical or rod-shaped yeah. synthetic vaccine virus-like particle. Do you, viruses have very specific shapes. Have, have you thought about manipulating the shape of those particles to mimic one of the native viruses' shape in maybe further potentiating or enhancing the immune response you get? Um, we, we haven't actually taken any steps toward doing it, but I think there's actually every reason to think it might make a difference. Um, one of my former colleagues at Santa Barbara has been w one of the leaders in trying to figure out, not for synthetic vaccines, but for endocytosis and other things, you know, how particle shape matters. And it really does matter. Um, a, a sphere and a rod, but now let's do it at constant volume uh, so that we're not talking about a sphere and a rod of the same radius. We're talking about a sphere and a rod of the same volume. The rod is more readily taken into cells, which is not the process exactly with, uh, well, it is sort of, I guess, with dendritic cells, but, uh, but um, regardless, uh, if a cell can find a smaller cross section through which to bring it in, it chooses that kind of cross section preferentially. So I think there's every reason to think that shape could matter in this. And so we should figure that out. Any more questions? Last, last question. Um, this attempt at engineering is a, a change of philosophy somewhat, as you pointed out. And you, engineering is the, 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 the uh, use of science in the society. Uh, is there a policy on implementing this in the society? I mean, uh, 
well, for example, getting to a clinical stage with this sort of thing, you haven't mentioned any mechanism or policy that that will probably be needed yeah. to transfer this. Well, the the way these the 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 policies already exist because we we wouldn't be. Um, doing something that wouldn't fall within the regular university procedures for clinical trials. And there's, there's clinical trials of all sorts of things that go on now. But what it does require is that, you know, we think through protocols that can actually be approved, that minimize danger, that uh, uh, are economical of resources, and, and those things are held to high scrutiny before you can uh, go to clinical trials. The, the, maybe the more challenging thing um, about the process of moving things into the world will be how do we interact with companies. And I'm not so concerned about how we interact with big existing companies. The, the trickier and less familiar things, uh, thing is, is starting new companies. And you know, when, when does work that's ongoing in your lab cross over to being commercial work and then if there's commercial work going on how connected can your lab be and you know uh, university inventors tend to think that they can do everything across the entire spectrum but at some point you have to make a clear separation between an organization that's trying to make a product and an organization that's trying to train students and researchers and we'll have to be careful about th those are those are covered uh, also by uh, processes, but the judgment calls are a little tougher in those cases under the conflict of interest policies and so on. So I, I think we'll have to, uh, you know, ha work within good conflict of interest policies that enable us to get stuff into the world, but protect the interests of graduate students and postdocs and the university itself that's working on these things. So. Thank you very much, Thank Professor you. Terrell. <laughs> Thank you.